Hi everyone, welcome to Volcano Tuesdays. My name is Gina and I am an educator with the Mount St. Helens Institute. I'm filming live from my bedroom in Portland and it's a little bit chilly today, so we've got the sweater and the scarf on to stay warm. But I'm really excited to introduce to you, we have a very special guest on our Volcano Tuesdays today. I want to remind you that Volcano Tuesdays is a free educational program that airs at 11 on Tuesdays once a week. And we are here to inspire your curiosity and questions about volcanoes. We hope to hear from you, to hear what you're interested in, so make sure to submit your feedback to us on our website. Each week, we'll have a live demonstration with activities that you can follow along, as well as a set of challenges. Complete those challenges and submit to us what you create, and we'll share it every week. Last week, we learned about the history of past eruptions at Mount St. Helens. Today we are going to focus on one eruption in particular, the eruption that occurred on May 18, 1980, just 40 years ago. To learn about this, we're going to bring in a very special guest, Alyssa Adams from Washington State Parks. Alyssa's going to lead us through a live ranger program, which includes some dance moves. So to be prepared for this activity, you'll need to clear some space and make sure that you can get up and move around. Let's welcome in Alyssa. Hi there, Gina. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. I'm so excited to be here today as a guest speaker with the Mount St. Helens Institute here with Washington State Parks. This week in our history is a big one for the Mount St. Helens community. Our agency, along with many others, are commemorating the 40th eruption anniversary of Mount St. Helens. Today, I want to bring to light three phases of the Mount St. Helens experience. The first part of our program will talk about the life before the eruption, the pre-eruption days. The second part of our program will talk about the eruption itself and what that would have been like. And the third part will be about the recovery process, the biological recovery all across the land. Now today's program is going to be a little special because we're going to get out there, dance and wiggle and move together. Let's go ahead and get started. Make sure you're standing up and able to participate with me. Let's go back 40 years ago. Have any of you ever time traveled before? No? Well, there's a first time for everything. Everybody up, let's time travel. The first step to time travel is to put on your imagination hats. Go ahead and put them on. Make sure they fit snugly. They don't wibble or wobble across your head. And make sure they're fastened securely beneath your chin. Step number two, I'm going to lasso you all to my belt so we stick together during this jump. Watch out for your heads there. Oh, okay. Feel it over there? Feel it over there? Okay. On the count of three, we're going to jump up and down to time travel, teleport ourselves 40 years into the past. On the count of three. One, two, three. Oh, whoa! Did you feel that? What an experience. Well, here we are, folks. Imagine, if you will, everything around us has changed. No more backyard, no more home, no more roof. Instead, you'd be in a beautiful old growth forest. There'd be towering tall trees above your head swaying in the breeze. A perfect bluebird sky day. A hawk soaring over, a creek doing what creeks do. And off in the distance, this is what you'd see. Mount St. Helens. Picturesque, postcard-worthy, practically symmetrical. Quite a beauty in its day, I must say. Because back then, it had all of its parts. It had a top. Way to go, mountain. A nice set of glaciers and a big, bountiful, old-growth forest. Life was pretty swell back then. Because the Gifford Pinchot National Forest was a recreational paradise. People came from near and far to experience all that they could in the shadow of an active volcano. But back then, do you think they realized how active it actually was? No way. They came to have a good time. They came to make memories, and they sure did. There was plenty to see and do. People came to go hiking, backpacking, camping, and wildlife watching. They came to climb the mountain to the very tippy top. Can people do that anymore today? <laughs> well. The top's a little hard to get to. It was relocated elsewhere. Besides the mountain and the forest, something else brought people in. A big body of water, four miles from the base of the mountain, and we call that Spirit Lake. And Spirit Lake was a hip happening place to be. There was sailing and swimming and fishing, canoeing and kayaking, hidden waterfalls that plunged 200 feet down to the cold and frigid lake. Regardless of your age, young or old, it didn't matter. There was something for everybody. Tucked between the forest and the shoreline was places to stay. Resorts, lodges and cabins for families, and summer camps for the kids. 
I tell ya, back then if you were a kid, you would have begged your parents to go to the YMCA summer camp. They told their campers, this is a place of a thousand memories. No pressure, that's a lot of memories for one kid in one summer. I want to show you something that was donated to our park as a memory of the good old days at Spirit Lake. Some of you might remember those days, canoeing across the lake with a Boy Scout group, jumping into the water to experience how cold it was, and don't get me started about Harmony Falls, that water was glacier fed. Right here is one of the old summer camp uniforms the counselors would have worn. Look at that logo, good old Spirit Lake. Well, times have changed, and as many of you realize, that landscape looks very different. Anybody know why? Any ideas what would have happened? What about Spirit Lake? What about the top of the mountain? Well, something big sure did happen. But before that big boom, there's a series of events that triggered that eruption. A series of events letting us know that something big was on the horizon. Let's go ahead and dance out those events together. All of a sudden, in mid-March of 1980, Mount St. Helens did something to remind us. It wasn't just a mountain, it was a volcano. Because all of a sudden it <gasps> hiccuped. Volcanically speaking, we call that an earthquake, and that was the first of many more to come. We had earthquakes beneath our feet, going off 24-7. Let's go ahead and dance like an earthquake. Here we go. Earthquakes beneath our feet. You give it a go. Well, those earthquakes were only part of the story, because at the same time we had something else happening called harmonic tremors. Constant ground movement and constant ground vibrations. That was caused from the magma, the, the gas, everything building up beneath our feet. Well, a harmonic tremor looks a little different than an earthquake. It looks and sounds a little bit like this. Ah! You gotta use your voice and your whole body. Let's have you give it a try. Let's all be harmonic tremors. Ah! Well, we've had earthquake, we've had harmonic tremors, but then something else kind of crazy happened. All of a sudden, the mountain did something unexpected. We had gas and pressure and all that magma rising inside the mountain and all of a sudden it popped into a phreatic eruption. Gas and ash exploded upwards and poured outwards. We call that a phreatic eruption. Let's give it a go together. We had a buildup of pressure inside the magma chamber of Mount St. Helens followed by a bang and a boom as a phreatic eruption let loose ash all across the landscape. Well, we're not quite done yet. Something else happened at Mount St. Helens. The mountain began to change shape. We call that deformation, a change in the shape of the mountain. Now I want to show you what that looked like with a series of photos. This was Mount St. Helens. As you can see, that picturesque postcard look no longer exists. It's been replaced by a funny lopsided appearance. Scientists called that the bulge. And this bulge grew five feet today. That was caused from the gas and magma liquid contents inside the mountain pushing outwards to the point where it cracked, fractured, and expanded the mountain, growing outwardly. Not upwards, but outwards. Let's take a look on the inside. What would that actually look like? Well, here we go. You have a mag magma chamber of ooigoo red bubbly magma and a side chamber of ooigoo red bubbly magma. This one was working pretty good. The steam and ash came up and out of the mountain in a series of phreatic eruptions. This one, not so much. The liquid magma was trapped inside and finally pushed, cracked outwards. Let's put a dance movement to go with that bulge growth. If you were the mountain growing like a bulge, boom, bang, boom. Your hands are the liquid magma punching outwards to break that rock. Let's have you give it a try. Everybody on the count of three. Be the bulge growing outwards. One, two, three. <laughs> Very well done. Well, that was a series of events leading to the monumental day, May 18th, 1980. Let's do them all together. We'll spring them into a dance. The first sign of something going haywire was earthquakes beneath our feet. The second idea that something was gonna go on was harmonic tremors. Ah! The third one was a buildup of pressure inside the mountain, escaping and upwards into a phreatic eruption, followed by the bulge growing outwards. 
Well, thank you so much for joining me as we put some dance moves to the pre-eruption buildup of Mount St. Helens. Join me for our second part as we talk about the eruption itself. But before we get ahead of ourselves, I want to share with you some very special content we've collected through a series of oral history projects. Let's hear firsthand from some people who remember that monumental day. I'd like to go ahead and share two quotes with you that we collected. Both of these are from folks who remember what it was like before the mountain blew. It was beautiful. It was absolutely beautiful. It's like the pictures. The mountain reflected into Spirit Lake, and there was Harmony Falls. You could walk around the trail. That's from Jackie Whitaker. She was 37 years old in 1980, and she was a local school teacher out here in Toodle, Washington. Here's our next one. The lake was spectacular beyond belief. It was mature, old-growth forest that surrounded it. At Spirit Lake, your view was of trees. That's from Mike Sencia. He was 19 years old in 1980, and he was a student out here. Today we also have two audio files we'd like to share with you. Both of these are recordings from folks who remember uh, life pre-eruption, and both of these actually spent their summers helping out the Spirit Lake summer camp scene. Let's go ahead and give those a listen. In the springtime, the wild flowers were just incredible. If you were up here early enough in the springtime, um, you better brought warm clothes because there was still snow tucked uh, around uh, in the camp. And of course, the further up the trails and to the ridges that you got, there was uh, usually still snow. Of course, if you were at the camp on the dock or in some of the open areas and you turned around and looked at the mountain, you had a perfect, I mean, everybody's postcard view of Mount St. Helens. Stepping out of our little cabin in the morning, the first thing I did, of course, was is the mountain out? What does it look like? And I have hundreds of pictures of every mood of the mountain, walking the shoreline around the lake, trying to catch some scenes, photoing the uh, different wildflowers and hiking the trails and seeing the herds of elk, uh, the bears that ran through our camp. Let's go ahead and dive into the second phase of our program, the eruption. Now the last thing I think you remember seeing is the bulge, the buildup of the magma inside the mountain exerting pressure outwardly and forcing the rock to move. That movement was incredible and before a spectator's eyes the mountain was changing shape. I want to show you what that looked like. Here's that bulge and here are the scientists monitoring it, measuring that growth every single day. Now this all of a sudden stopped one afternoon. It was known as a period of quiescence, a period of silence and quiet. All that buildup, all that movement, all of a sudden stopped. And that was really confusing for the community. Can you imagine what they thought? They didn't know what to believe. The news and radio was reporting that the mountain was going to blow, but everything in front of them said the opposite. It had all stopped. What would you have done? Would you have packed your bags and left, or would you have stayed and waited to see what was going on? Well, let's see what happened. After two long weeks of waiting, after two long weeks of wondering, Mount St. Helens answered our questions in a very dramatic and memorable way. On the morning of May 18th, 8.32 a.m., the mountain shook from a violent earthquake registering at 5.2 on the Richter scale. Everybody shake! And as that mountain shook, the entire bulge began to drop. And as it dropped, tremendous power, pressure, and fury, it was the largest landslide in recorded history. That landslide started at the top, made its way all the way down and climbed the ridge line, up and over it, and curb plunk, dumped all of its contents into Spirit Lake. Now, I don't know if you remember this part, but Spirit Lake was kind of a lake full of water, doing what it does best, being majestic and beautiful. It wasn't aware of the mountain's plans to rearrange. So as the mountain entered the lake, all the water emptied out. The lake bed rose 200 feet with tree trunks, rock, ice, ash, soil, and chunks of Mount St. Helens, filling the entire Spirit Lake Basin. We've got some dance moves to do today. The first step of the eruption was that earthquake. Did everybody shake together? Everybody wiggle? Everybody shake? The second step of the eruption was the monumentally large landslide. Everybody go like this. The landslide starts at the top of the mountain, cascades down into an arch, over in ridgeline, out to the end. Let's do that again. Let's do a landslide together. 
the apex of the mountain, down it goes, over a ridge line, up to the end. Let's have you give it a go. Very well done. Now after the earthquake, after the landslide, something else happened called a pyroclastic flow. Superheated, 1600 degree Fahrenheit stone wind. I'm talking about flying rocks. This one, right here, kind of clunky, kind of heavy. It's called a lava block or lava bomb. What do bombs do? That's right, they explode and this was no exception. It shot out of the mountain, it knocked over the trees, it crash landed all across the land, punching, pounding, hammering the soil, leaving behind a field of lava rocks. Now this rock, this daysite rock, wasn't the only one. We had another rock known as pumice. And pumice is very lightweight and aerated. I'd like to show you what that looks like. This pumice rock went traveling miles to the sky, and it sounded like this. And as that rock shone and flown up through the sky, all across the landscape, it once again covered the surrounding area. Now those rocks combined are known as the pyroclastic flow. Let's do that dance move together. Fist behind you, releasing the pressure, and pyroclastic flow. Once again, fist behind you, your daysite rock, your pumice rock, all of a sudden the pressure released in a pyroclastic flow. Something else happened afterwards, called a lahar, a volcanic mud flow. Let's figure out why. Mount St. Helens had a lot of glaciers, snow, and ice on the top of the mountain. And as that mountain got hot, it triggered those melting, melting of the glaciers and all that water. It traveled down the mountain in the path of least resistance, down all of our waterways. The North and South Rotoodle River, into the Couch River, into the mighty Columbia River, by the time it hit the Columbia River, 50 miles from our volcano, it had risen 20 feet with sediment and debris from Mount St. Helens. Can you believe that? Let's go ahead and put a dance move to the word lahar. But first, I want to show you what the lahar even look like. This right here is a lahar. It's like chocolate milk gone horribly wrong, except it was hot, bubbling, boiling, scorching to the touch, more like hot cocoa. But instead of marshmallows on top, houses, cars, and bridges cruising down the river. Let's use this as inspiration to do our dance movement. Here's what I think a lahar would look like. The lahar traveled down the river just like this, all the way to the west. Let's give that a go today, together. Here's the lahar dance move, traveling down the river all the way to the west. Now you give it a go. Very well done. Now our last dance move associated with the eruption in 1980 of Mount St. Helens is the aftermath. Now I don't know if you remember this part, but after the mountain blew itself, the ash plume rose 15 miles high into the sky and stayed there for nine hours, raging upwards, a reminder of what had just happened that very morning. Here's what that looks like. Here's that ash plume rising up to the sky. And as the ash traveled all the way up, the wind blew it to the east. As it traveled to the east, it landed in places like Richville, Spokane, Yakima, dropping down across those communities. But it didn't stop there. It went around our entire world for two whole weeks. Before it stopped right here at the mountain where it started and sprinkled down upon us once again. Now back then, they made a bumper sticker and it said, don't come to Washington, Washington will come to you. And it sure did in the form of ash that fell from the sky. And that ash looked like this. The lighter the particles, the farther it traveled. From the beginning, we had an earthquake that shook the mountain. A landslide taking material all the way down from the top over a ridge line up and down. We had a lahar of mud going west along the rivers. We had pyroclastic flows of superheated rock shooting outwards. And we had ash that came up and fell down from the sky. Can you guys do that? Go ahead and teach your family those dance moves you learned all about the eruption of Mount St. Helens. Let's go ahead and hear some more quotes from folks who remember that eruption. These ones in particular had a close connection to the land and their professions depended upon it. When people saw an umbrella cloud and heard boom, 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 they could only assume a bomb had been dropped. 
That was from Carolyn Dreacher. She was 27 years old that day, and she's a United States Geological Service glaciologist. Here's our next one. There is talcum powder dust everywhere. Horses, trees, and cows were covered in it. It was a monochromatic scene of death. That's from Les Baden. He was 33 years old, working as a photo reporter with KGW-TV out in Portland, Oregon. Now beyond those quotes, I'd like to share a few more audio files with each and every one of you, and I feel so honored and privileged to have interviewed these people. It was quite an experience. Let's go ahead and give them a listen. It was the first time in my life that I ever faced the fact that the landscape that I was familiar with was totally gone. You couldn't go back and look at the pieces. It was vanished. That was really weird. It was a weird feeling. I mean, I would guess that the most that I had out of it was shock. Because those things, I grew up around Mount St. Helens. I went up there the first time when I was three years old. And you think of the landscape as being more permanent. And when the landscape disappears, Mount St. Helens was still there. But the Spirit Lake was long gone. It would be like living through, you know, Pompeii or something and having the whole thing be underwater. As you got closer and closer, the, to the next level would be where the dead trees were and blown over trees. And holy mackerel, that was nothing like I'd ever seen. Just giant trees just ripped out of the ground and busted up and, and then covered with feet of ash. And then I got into what we call the zone of complete destruction where there wasn't even soil left and there was nothing left to say. You didn't see birds, you didn't see anything you didn't think that's when it first time that really came into perspective how big this is let's go ahead and dive into the third part of our program the recovery process after the mountain erupted things looked very different it was almost unrecognizable the green and blue beautiful landscape was converted to the color gray everything was gray as far as the eye could see let's take a look at it here is mount st helens after that eruption a barren moonscape, practically desolate, as if nothing could have survived. A reminder of what had just happened and a scar across our landscape. Scientists were so concerned that the recovery process would take a very, very long time. They didn't know if anything had actually survived the eruption, and the process to refilm this landscape would take years and years on end. But all of a sudden, one day, scientists discovered something that would change the shape of Mount St. Helens recovery process from that day forward. Let's go ahead and take a look. If you were a scientist back in 1980, one of the first things you did after the mountain blew was hop in a helicopter. Everybody get on then. Open the door, get inside, take a seat, buckle up, and grab that steering wheel. Let's fly across the pumice plain of Mount St. Helens. As you flew across the pumice plain and you looked as far as the eye could see, the colors you once were familiar with had been changed forever. Everybody give that a try. Step number one to the dance process is being a helicopter pilot. Everybody get in and go ahead and turn that wheel, flying all across the pumice plain. Well, all of a sudden, the helicopter decided to land, and as they did, so they stepped out across the landscape, and they were not expecting to find much. They looked across, left and right, and all of a sudden, <gasps> something popped up right in front of them. It was a pile of something brown, dark. It looked like soil, it looked like dirt, but what on earth could it be? What would you have out here after a monumental eruption on St. Helens it was not gray. Well, scientists took a closer look. As they got in, down to that ground, <gasps> something was shocking, looking right back at them. Baby Chewbacca. This is called a pocket gopher. And this pocket gopher did something fantastic. It survived the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens. How, you ask? Well, before the eruption, it was springtime, and all those little animals were gathering all their food and all their bedding to go down underground for hibernation during the winter months. During the winter months, this little guy took a long siesta, sleeping the eruption away. Little did he know what was going on above his head. Let's go ahead and be a pocket gopher emerging from his little lair. Now remember, little pocket gopher had an elaborate home beneath the ground. He had tunnel systems to a bedroom, to a kitchen, to a bathroom, and all of those were protected from the eruption under layers and layers of soil. But all of a sudden, his instincts kicked in and he said, it's time to wake up. His little internal alarm clock went off and he began to dig. And as he dug and dug and dug and dug and all he could, he's like, oh! 
he looked around and he was in shock. His life had changed forever. What he now saw was not anything he had seen before. Instead of the trees and the grass he was used to, it was replaced with rock. But something special happened that day. When little pocket gopher emerged from beneath, he brought something up to the surface with him. He brought soil and insect and nutrients, stuff from his bathroom called scat. All that got brought up to the surface. And that pile left over was like compost, fresh, fertile ground. Now after that happened, it started to get windy. Do you hear the wind? Listen to that wind all around us. As the wind blew in, seeds collected on those currents, and the seeds came in and landed right there on the soil. Pretty soon, because it's Washington, it started to rain. As the rain came down, those seeds began to propagate. They began to flourish, and they grew. And those seeds grew into flowers. They are called lupin flowers. I want to show you what they look like. These lupin flowers grew up all across the ground, and they were beautiful. They come in colors like pink and white and blue and purple. And as they grew nice and tall, only about that tall on the ground, this shrubby vegetation began to collect more debris from the wind coming in. Now this plant's got a real special capability. It's called nitrogen fixing. It pumps nutrients into the soil to make it hospitable once again. It enhances the biology of the soil, all of those layers of nutrients underneath. Well, this flower deserves a dance movement as well. Let's be lupin flowers together. Lupin flowers grow nice and tall like this, up to the sky where the sun is at. Let's try that one more time. We're going to be a lupin flower growing from our roots all the way up. And lupin flowers kind of bend in the breeze all across the pumice plain. There weren't trees to protect them, so all that breeze oh, came right at them. Let's give it a try together. Are you ready to be lupin flowers? Here we go. Lupin flowers growing and swaying and bending in the breeze. Very good job. Let's recap where we are so far. Helicopters with scientists inside arrived on scene to the pumice plain, surveying the land all about. Then they noticed little guys called pocket gophers emerging from the soil, bringing with them fresh nutrients. Then flowers started to grow. Now guess what? After flowers started to grow, more vegetation came in, and all of a sudden you had islands of vegetation. Those pockets of green actually enticed another critter to our scene. What kind of animal loves to eat vegetables? All they do is eat vegetables. They're called an herbivore. Let me see if you know who I'm talking about. I've got a special surprise for you. Does anybody know who this is? Oh my gosh, take a look at my heavy antlers. I'm what they call an elk. An elk were one of the first animals to come back to the scene after the eruption of Mount St. Helens. Oh, these are pretty heavy. I'm going to drop my antlers. Oh, oh. Well, after the eruption, those elk came in, and I want to show you what they did. Those elk have really big hoofs, and those hoofs, almost as big as my human hand, were very heavy because elk can weigh up to 400 pounds. As the elk came in, squash, 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 they pushed down all that ash, that tephra layer, and they broke through that crusty surface. Doing so allowed the sun to penetrate through, as well as uh, the rain coming down from the sky. Let's be elk walking around. Da -dun, da -dun, da -dun. Da -dun. Now remember, they use their big, huge hoofs. Da -dun, da -dun, da -dun, da -dun. There you are, being an elk. Now the elk didn't just come to walk around. The elk came for a buffet. And on that buffet list today was all kinds of flowers, including the lupin. Let me show you what they did. Like I mentioned, <laughs> they're very large. Sometimes elk can stand at your shoulder height. That's how big they are. So this elk being an herbivore, has a big set of teeth. And those teeth are used to masticate and grind down all that fibrous material. And they did so in large quantities. The elk came through, eating all that they could. Little bit of this, mm, little bit of this. Mm, mm. And the more they ate, the fuller they got, and the fuller they got, something happened. We call it, hmm, your gut's full. It's a natural process. We've all experienced it. When your tummy gets really full, what happens? It's natural. You go number two. It's called scat if you're in the animal world. On the count of three, say scat with me. One, two, three, scat. Now, from now on, 
we don't call it that P-O-O-P -O -O -P word. No way. We call it scat. You sound way more scientific. Now that scat, everywhere it drops, looked like this. And that scat across a landscape was little pockets full of nutrients, fiber from the plants they ate, everything from the digestive tract exited in this little pellet. And this little pellet, this little sack of compost, was excellent for the landscape. Everywhere it dropped, guess what happened? More plants grew up to the sky they reached. So let's recap. Scientists arrive in helicopters. They find pocket gophers. Flowers are growing. Elk have moved in. Well, after the elk move in, pretty soon, as they foraged across the landscape, the trees grew taller and taller and taller. Let's be trees across the land. Now before we do that, I want to let you know, it wasn't all trees at once that came in. There's only certain species that come back after a natural disaster, like a volcanic eruption. Willow trees and alder trees. The alder in particular is nitrogen fixing, just like the lupin flower. Let's be an alder tree. Here you are under the soil, and pretty soon you grow tall and you spread your branches out. Very good. Let's do it again. For alder trees, roots down to the ground, we spread our branches out and grow nice and tall. Let's have you do it. Very well done. Now, if you've got a forest coming back, across the land, you've got islands of vegetation, trees growing nice and tall, someone else arrives on the scene too. But this little guy doesn't have feet to walk or claws to dig. This critter has wings to fly. They're birds and the birds came back in full abundance. As the birds came across the sky, they came in and their droppings, their scat, populated across the area. Land in places like Spirit Lake, adding bacteria back into that deprived ecosystem. Pretty soon algae started to grow and flourish, and pretty soon oxygen was replenished back into the water source. And as those birds flew in, all varieties of birds, one in particular was a very great helper. Have you ever heard of a woodpecker before? Woodpeckers happen to really love ravaged landscapes. They like things called snags, standing dead trees. I've got a friend for you to meet today. This guy, right here, is a woodpecker. Look at him fly in, all the way up to the screen, taking a look at you, pecking, 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 pecking. This woodpecker landed on the trees and pecked to his heart's desire, looking for all those insects and helping to break down that tree itself. Once again, like all the other critters, adding nutrients back to the landscape. And as he did so, more and more and more trees grow. Let's go ahead and use our little friend here to add one final dance movement. Let's do the woodpecker. Put your claws up like this. Birds are called talons. You got your talons on the bark of the tree, and you got to move your head forward like this. Over, over, over. Once again, do the woodpecker. Talons up on the tree. Peck, peck, peck. Let's go ahead and combine all our dance movements together to remember the recovery at Mount St. Helens. You've got helicopters driven by scientists coming back in to view the pumice plain. You have pocket gophers climbing to the surface, digging from their underground burrows, looking at the new land, bringing fresh soil to the nutrients. You have elk coming in, and the elk are coming in. Ba-dum, 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 to eat the lupin flowers growing in the breeze. And after those flowers grew, those trees came in, and those trees grew really tall all the way up to the surface. And those trees were a great home for woodpeckers coming in to peck, peck, peck. <laughs> Very good job, all of you. Now, one final thing I want to tell you so you don't forget. It's thanks to all these animals and plants that we now have a full recovery process at Mount St. Helens. The next time you think about that mountain, I want you to remember, the green thumbs of those little pocket gophers who helped to plant the plants, and the green bums of those elk who helped to fertilize the landscape once again. Thank you so much for joining me here today. Let's go ahead and listen to some people who remember that recovery process and describe it in great detail. Oh, hi there, sorry about that. I'm just reading a really cool old newspaper by the Columbian because uh, that's who our next quote is by. Within a year, we were doing stories on how this devastated area was coming alive with plant life and wildlife. 
from Dan Tolva. He was 31 years old and he was the editor at the Columbian newspaper in Vancouver, Washington. Let's take a look at that. Here's our next quote. I was amazed at how fast little baby trees were growing out there. That's from Richard Slayton Jr. He was 30 years old at the time. We've also got some audio files to share with you today. Let's go ahead and give those a listen. At first, all I could see was the scar. And the last time I was up there, I could barely see the scars at all. All I could see was the new growth, the verdant, just beautiful, beautiful rolling mountains, the, 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 the sides of the mountain covered with wildflowers, um, elk, deer, all the wildlife there. Um, I think that nature does know best and it has helped itself by adding the minerals, the nutrients, and changing the landscape. Change and rebirth from almost total destruction, as they thought at first nothing was living, to all that has come back and is living now. I, I think of that quite often. There was this one small patch of green as you approach the pumice plain, it's not yet on the pumice plain, but it's within a couple of hundred meters. And I'm like, I, holy smokes, I cannot believe on this hill slope that there's survivors here. So we immediately ran up to this patch and we started writing down all the plant species that we saw. And it turned out to be like 26 different plant species that survived. But we said, obviously, this is a place, if we're going to work with small mammals, they would be attracted to this place's of green, one, for covering forage, and two, if the plants survived, maybe the mammals did as well. So we put traps out, and sure enough, we came back the next day, and there were deer mice there, as well in our traps, live traps, as well as a long-tailed bull. So that gave us pretty convincing evidence that even within just a few miles of the volcano and to the northeast, that in this small isolated patch, that as far as you could see, there was no other green, that this was clear evidence of the importance of these biological legacies. I want to thank everybody for joining me here this afternoon as we learned all about Mount St. Helens through motion, movement, and dance. It was a pleasure to join all of you today. And this is a commemoration for the 40th European anniversary of Mount St. Helens. Today is May 19th, and yesterday, 40 years ago, was a big date in our history. I want to recap what we learned through a series of photos. Let's take a look together. This was the beauty of life at Mount St. Helens. It was vivid, clear, and gorgeous. We got to listen to some people experience this firsthand. After the mountain blew, this is what we were left with, an almost unrecognizable moonscape. We heard from folks who remembered this as well, who had emotional reactions to this big day in history. And lastly, if you come to visit Mount St. Helens, this is what you'll see nowadays, a beautiful changed landscape. 40 years really has brought a lot to our area. We have trees coming in once again, a habitat for the animals. We have Spirit Lake, a new location where aquatic invertebrates and animals come back in to flourish. We've got our crater rim and a beautiful new dome built from the 04 to 08 eruption phase. Now, before we really conclude our program today, I have one final challenge for all of us. Let's string together all those dance moves we learned this afternoon when we learned about the buildup, the eruption, and the recovery process. Are you ready for this challenge? If you're able and willing, please stand up with me. Here we go. The first clue that something was going on in Mount St. Helens was earthquakes beneath our feet. Harmonic tremors all about. Ah! Phreatic eruptions built from pressure, building within, a pop and a blow. Then we had the mountain changing shape as the liquid rock inside started to push out. Pow, 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 deformation. Then the actual eruptive event began with a massive earthquake. The earthquake was followed by a landslide up, down, around, and through Spirit Lake. Then we had a pyroclastic flow of superheated stone rocks. After that pyroclastic flow, we had a lahar across the river, all the way down. Then we had the aftermath, the ash falling down from the sky. Then we go into the recovery process. First things did, 
scientists came back to the scene, driving their helicopters, flying across the land to survey all they could see. What they saw were pocket gophers popping up from the surface, digging from their little burrows. Then they saw lupin flowers growing in the breeze. Then the elk came by to eat those flowers. Ba-bump, 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 and leave behind scat. Boop! Then we had those alder trees growing from the roots up, spreading their branches, followed by the birds that came back through, including woodpeckers. Peck, 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 peck. There you have it. The entire eruption, buildup, and recovery process of Mount St. Helens through dance. A big thank you to every single one of you. It's truly been a blast. Wow, thank you so much, Alyssa. What a fantastic presentation. This oral history project was made possible through Washington State Parks Folks and Traditional Arts Program. Alyssa and fellow interpretive staff at the State Park performed the oral histories that we listened to today. Note that we shared only a small sample of the many interviews in this oral history collection and that these are curated by the State Park. To learn and hear more, make sure to follow Washington State Parks on social media and visit the Spirit Lake Visitor Center when it reopens. A great big thank you to Alyssa and her fellow interpretive staff for sharing with us these special resources in honor of the 40th anniversary of the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens. Thank you also one more time to Alyssa for being a fantastic interpretive educator and for sharing with us such fun dance moves. Our challenges for Volcano Tuesday this week are to recreate some of the moves that Alyssa taught us and do the full Mount St. Helens 1980 pre, during, and post eruption series. Take a video or picture of yourself doing some of the moves and send to us and we will feature on our website and social media as well as on Volcano Tuesdays for next week. If you want to get creative, you can also submit to us a story of your imagination, what you think it might have been like to experience the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens. The details about these challenges are listed on our website. We at the Mount St. Helens Institute are excited you were able to tune in for this episode of Volcano Tuesdays. We work to inspire curiosity about Mount St. Helens through field trips, outdoor school, and online programming. Consider donating to us to continue these, this program and others to support our work throughout the year. A huge thank you to all of the partners and supporters that make Volcano Tuesdays possible. That's the U.S. Forest Service, the U.S. Geological Survey, the Cowlitz Indian Tribe, Discover Your Northwest, and our many hundreds of volunteers and program participants, including you. You make our programs happen and you make them awesome. Remember to submit your feedback about what you're curious about volcanoes to help us help inform what we do in this program. Thanks again for tuning in and we'll see you next week.